Um, let me bring up my screen. Okay, cool. Can everyone see this okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I'm Margaret Mitchell. I'm pretty excited to be here. Um, I'll be talking about work on data governance that I did with my co-chair Yasin Jurnit as part of something called the Big Science Project. Um, it's uh, a bit of a niche area that is a little bit hard to find people who are interested in it. And so it's really excited. I'm really excited to be at this event where people are actually really interested in the kinds of things you can do with data governance. Um, so, so thank you uh, everyone for coming and uh, thank you for having me. Um, so um, my talk today is on uh, data governance within big science and big science was a community effort to create a large open language model. Um, a lot of the work that I'm talking about today are, or I should say, is in a paper um, that was presented at FACT 2022. So if you want sort of more details or some of the actual uh, documentation, paperwork things that we developed, then you can find it in that paper. Um, it's the work of uh, 21 different people. Um, here are some faces of uh, folks who were involved. Um, and so I'll do my best to represent um, everyone's everyone's work here. So it was definitely a, a group collaborative effort. Um, so for the plan, I'll uh, approach this as sort of talking about the what uh, and then the how. Then we'll do a deep dive specifically into custodianship uh, for data governance, um, and then some lessons learned and next steps. Okay, so let's talk about what. Um, so first, the work I'm describing uh, was conducted within the context of the Big Science Workshop, uh, which is was um, a year-long project. Um, although the year has ended, a lot of the working groups, including governance, um, are still meeting occasionally, keeping work ongoing um, due to just the um, continued interest and the sense that there's so much more to do. Um, but Big Science was originally just a year-long project, uh, bringing together around 1,000 participants. Um, in practice, around 500 were active. Um, from 65 countries uh, to work on training and studying a multilingual large language model in an open and collaborative fashion. So the work took place across uh, 30 working groups addressing various technical and social aspects of large language models. Um, you can see here on the right, uh, the breakdown of the different groups that were developed as part of the Big Science Project. Uh, data governance, which is the working group that I co-chaired, um, which is the source of the work today, um, is here amongst a bunch of other um, working groups. So it was uh, quite a large effort. Um, and it presented a unique opportunity to make significant contributions to the state of distributed language data governance research, um, and specifically in the context of large-scale technology development. Um, its focus was on multilinguality and geographical diversity, as well as multidisciplinarity. Um, so it allowed us to uh, think about and work on the kinds of things that often aren't worked on or haven't been worked on previously. Um, given how fast the technology and the regulations surrounding data and models are evolving, um, we really thought it was important to begin designing processes for data management that work for all stakeholders. Um, and that really requires having a space that allows different perspectives and expertise to meet and interact uh, directly. Um, in case you're not familiar with large language models, uh, which was the main focus of the big science effort, um, they can be used to generate language. So a very, very basic way to understand what a large language model is, 
is it's something that if you give it the start of a sentence, such as today I went to the store and it can finish the rest of the sentence. Um, it's actually behind a lot of technology, not just language generation. So recently um, the news has talked about work in uh, language generation for diplomatic conversations, for scientific text, that's just been within the past week. Um, but language models are actually behind a lot of other technologies used for classification. So um, doing something like sentiment detection, toxicity detection, these are often built on language models, sort of another model put on top of a language model, where the language model provides probabilities of different words co-occurring. Um, language models are also used in things like uh, search and recommendation systems. Basically, any space where you are working with text data is a space where language models can help provide the probabilities of different things occurring. And then this can be used in a variety of different ways. Um, so some example well-known uh, modern language models include BERT and GPT-3 uh, from Google and OpenAI respectively. Uh, the approach in the big science workshop was to follow the modeling protocol that had been developed for GPT. So it was uh, striving to be state of the art, but a very sort of basic state of the art um, so that there weren't lots of additional bells and whistles, but we were just capturing sort of um, the fundamental of what the state of the art in uh, language modeling is. Um, so why focus on language models? Well, they are proliferating in usage. Um, whether or not you know it, most of the things you're exposed to online with text um, is now in some way involving a language model. Um, so the kinds of things that language models learn are affecting what we understand reality to be when we interact online. So it's really important to understand how they work and what's going on, and then come up with uh, different processes and structures that enable um, and empower different stakeholders um, to meet their sort of goals and needs. Um, unfortunately, language models are at a point where the resources available to train them are only available at big industry labs. Um, so there's limited access to the data that's used for training um, for external parties. Um, limited access to the actual models. If they're available, they're often behind an API and you can't uh, directly um, work on things like explainability uh, or further sort of um, interrogation of the model. They're not designed as research tools, so they're difficult to research. Um, they tend to be Anglo-centric. They tend to be monolingual. Uh, they've been shown to uh, encode biases that have to do with racism, with sexism, with nationalism, uh, with um, religious ideologies. A lot of the groups that are called sensitive groups or protected groups in different countries, different identity groups, end up having biases towards them encoded by the model. Um, often the carbon footprint isn't taken into account. That's changed just within the past couple of weeks as uh, we've al also published another paper of the carbon footprint of our work. Um, and also ethical, legal, societal implications are sort of left for future work. It's often given that the model is a step in progress and there's all these socio-technical issues, but you know we're enabling other people to work on them. <laughs> but then the other people aren't there, right? They're not actually... No one's putting resources into these sort of socio-technical problems around language models. Um, so this is one of the things that the big science workshop was really aiming to do, um, was really, you know, put power in the hands of the people where normally you can't understand language models in a really fine-grained level if you're not in an industry uh, or an industry lab. And now with the big science uh, workshop, you can't. Um, so that's a lot of uh, what was happening with the language model work within big science. 
Um, it's worth noting that the data that we selected um, was uh, not only multilingual, but it also had owners and custodians spread around the world, situated in different contexts and jurisdictions. Um, you can see this a bit on the map on the left here. Uh, the main languages were English, French, um, Chinese, um, and we had a variety of other languages that we sourced um, from, uh, from different owners throughout the world. Um, Spanish was relatively well represented. Um, we also ended up having a variety of programming languages as well. Um, and these all formed the training data of the language model that we worked on as part of big science. Um, so why focus on data governance? There's so much to work on in technology. There's so much to work on when it comes to language models. Um, what's the point of focusing on data governance in particular? Um, we really wanted to explore the space of what was possible. I think the people in the working group were really interested in how to give power to uh, people whose data, whose text, were being used in language models. So the current state of the art is that uh, you produce text online, it gets scraped by, you know, a Google, uh, you know, some sort of web search, it's released on Common Crawl, it's used to train a language model, uh, that language model is used for profit, but you have no say over the data. It might be things that you have said, um, but there's no transparency into what that you've said is being collected, how it's being used. Um, there's very little work or transparency on anonymization. So if you're saying something that's private or personal, we don't know what's being scraped and stored and perhaps memorized by language models that are then shared with a broader public. Um, the consent mechanisms that are in place for large language model training data are very poor. So you know, amongst this group, you might think about all the times that you've been asked to consent to have something you've written online be used as part of language model training data. Um, probably none of you have had that direct experience. Um, and that's because normally these kinds of things are buried in terms of services. So there's this difference between consent, which is, you know, some sort of legally binding thing and informed consent where you actually know what you're consenting to. And that latter, uh, that, that latter approach to consent, this informed consent, is not something that's the current state of the art in data uh, collection and data training for language models. Um, so we really saw an opportunity here to think about how to address these issues and, and how to start tackling them. Um, so we worked with a small network of organizations um, and people who are themselves interested uh, in working on different aspects of uh, data and data governance to help develop tools and protocols um, and different kinds of agreements um, that will hopefully help have more sort of values informed uh, data sharing and collection. Um, I think Daniel Van Streen is here. I uh, just want to say he was incredibly helpful in all of this. He was the core member of the working group. Um, and a lot of the work that we did could not have happened without him, um, in, including this presentation today. Um, <laughs> it's via Daniel's connections. So um, if he's here, hi, and, and thank you um, for all of your work. Uh, and he can probably answer um, a lot of the questions uh, better than I can. <laughs> okay, cool. So. When we were first defining the data governance working group, um, we asked ourselves, why should our communities care about data governance? Um, in recent years, we've seen machine learning systems grow significantly in the amount of data they can absorb. So all this stuff you're scraping off the internet. Um, and it's usually the internet. It's usually not ar archival sources. It's usually not from libraries. Um, but machine learning systems uh, are data driven. So uh, you can really shape the kinds of things that they learn if you can shape the kinds of data that it learns from. 
Um, and so the performance of the systems, uh, the range of situations that the systems will work in are heavily dependent on the data and what you're doing with the data. Um, so the sort of data hungry nature of language models has motivated a lot of work in increasing um, data capacity, so hardware improvements, um, so that the quantity of data that you can actually use um, can be increased. Um, but comparatively little attention has been paid to ensuring that the, there's sufficiently diverse and representative data um, uh, available to the language model, um, especially in a way that respects the data and algorithm subjects' rights and upholds their interest. So our work proposed to address this by focusing on uh, two questions, many questions, but here are at least two of our primary ones. Um, how can we bring together heterogeneous sources of data with different owners, stakeholders, and in different juris jurisdictions? in the respect of the rights legally guaranteed to their owners and data subjects? Um, and how can we give data owners and rights holders more control over the uses of their data so that they can shape the development process of new technology as active participants? Um, so both of these questions are part of a field known as collaborative data governance. Uh, and this is what I dive into a bit further in this talk. So let's talk more about data governance in machine learning and how we're defining data governance. So governance is a nebulous concept whose exact definition varies significantly across domains. One way to define governance relevant to this work is as a set of processes and methods for making decisions about managing data in a given context. Um, and we really wanted to focus on collaborative aspects of this. So creating a governance structure where collaboration was a fundamental feature. Um, we wanted the processes to be informed by values um, as well as goals, and then also applicable regulations and law. Um, there are currently a few ways that data is being uh, governed and managed in machine learning. Um, this includes centralized data set management in institutions like the Linguistic Data Consortium, or LDC, um, public data repositories like the Hugging Face Dataset Hub, and open data initiatives like the Crawl-based OSCAR or the Pile Dataset. Uh, one positive recent development across all these models in recent years has been the adoption of more well-spread and standardized documentation practices. So this is spurred in great part by foundational works on data statements for natural language processing by Dr. Emily Bender and co-authors, and data sheets for data sets by Dr. Timnit Gabru and co-authors. And it's extremely important progress for data governance because good documentation fosters transparency, which in turn supports the agency of data subjects and those affected in decisions about the data. Uh, however, all of the models so far that I've mentioned um, have different benefits and, and significant limitations. Um, we still have a way to go if we want to adopt data governance approaches that remain suited to the changing data needs in our field, uh, in language research, um, in technology development. The good news is that there have been quite a few recent uh, developments in the space of data government, data governance um, from a few different initiatives. Probably many of you here are, are familiar or involved. Um, so we've seen a significant uptake in data protection regulations around the world, including the uh, PIPA, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act passed in Canada in 2000. Uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, passed in the EU in 2016. The California Consumer Privacy Act uh, from 2018, and many others. We're also seeing more and more scholarship and activism on data governance from a range of diverse institutions. So the list of icons presented here is far from exhausted, um, are far from exhaustive and focuses on institutions that we've interacted heavily with or really drew inspiration from. 
Um, so it spans uh, a variety of different kinds of institutions, public and private. Um, and uh, given the international focus of big science, we wanted to draw special attention to the efforts from the Tehiko Maori Radio on indigenous sovereignty um, and the Sipit Center in Kenya that has done amazing work studying relevant regulations across African jurisdictions. Uh, so both of these efforts really centered the, the owners of the data um, and focused on things like guardianship, where the goal was to uh, protect the values and the people uh, where the data comes from. We also learned a lot from the European network Claren, um, which organizes local consortia across Europe to collaborate on language data governance with a focus on social sciences. Cool, so now let's get into the how. So how did we structure our work on data governance in the big science workshop? We started with a preliminary definition of our high level goals and the roles that come into play in data governance. We then took a look at the values that should help drive data governance. We had an ethical charter for the overall project, which I'll discuss in a moment. Um, but we put it in a framework of value pluralism so that we could also have values for governance specifically. Um, the main reason why we wanted to um, think about the different kinds of dimensions of language data relevant to governance um, was because this is often just generally overlooked in machine learning. Um, so we wanted to look at the social, the legal, the technical context of language data, looking at relevant aspects of language discrimination, privacy and user rights, reproducible research. There are all of these outstanding goals and questions that um, different organizations have looked at within their own sort of spheres, um, but it really hasn't come together within a machine learning uh, framework or, or for a machine learning system, even though machine learning systems are so fundamental to many people's lived experiences day to day. Um, and then after we thought we had at least done some of our homework on the context, we started working on proposing the actual structure. Um, and we defined a skeleton structure by identifying the main roles that we thought needed to be in place the relationships, and then we started creating buy-in across um, the different parties involved. Um, okay, so here are the values we were working with. There's two sets. The first set, the one on the left, is the ethical charter. The ethical charter was established for big science as a whole. So all of the different working groups were operating within this value set. Um, so things like inclusivity and diversity and openness. Um, within the smaller data governance working group, we establish values specific to governance. Um, and so I think it's important to highlight this because uh, I'm often asked working in ethics of AI, why there isn't just one set of values or you know, whose values are correct, these kinds of things. Um, and I think that misses the point that different contexts um, and different kinds of projects should prioritize different sorts of values. And what you want to do is work within a structure where um, you can support uh, uh, value harmonization, uh, value pluralism. We want these things to be able to interact. We want these things to be able to be weighed as sort of pros and cons. Um, and not take it as a given that there's some one fundamental set of correct values, uh, but rather really think about things in these sort of larger contextual ways. Um, so the, the governance values we ended up focusing on, um, and this was a group effort through many sort of conversations, talking through things that were important to us in light of the goals, um, were things like inclusion and representation, um, so we wanted to make sure um, that people could equally participate uh, across cultures and language technologies. Um, we wanted to prioritize autonomy, which um, we broke down into consent and contestation. So consent is um, 
consenting to have your data used. Uh, I think this is familiar to people. Uh, contestation is the ability to opt out, to say no, or to say, I want my data removed. Uh, so we looked at those as two sides of a coin where we wanted to be able to support both. Um, privacy, the right to control one's personal data and information. Um, what we called just rewards, so the right to benefit from uses of one's data. Um, we struggled a bit with how to name this, but basically the idea was that um, we wanted the data usage to be just. Uh, and so uh, that includes a company profiting from that data, sharing that profit with the people whose data had been used for the profit, right? So just rewards um, is what we ended up sort of calling that, that mode of thinking. Um, we also wanted to respect licensing and attribution, local knowledge, um, and this is something that we, we got from the Maori project in particular. Um, so local expressions of values and their context should take precedence um, when making and implementing local decisions. Um, participation and, and collaboration, so we wanted to make sure to continually integrate feedback and people's needs. Um, and then benef uh, beneficence, which is that the above rights are subject to do no harm first. Um, so that was the basic set. And then the nice thing about having these values is that as you're working through making decisions, it's much easier to all come to an agreement because you're all grounded with the same basic priority set. Um, so, uh, from there, we were thinking about what are the different roles that need to be in place in order for these values to be instantiated. Um, so there are four primary roles in the proposed structure. Uh, data custodians, which host the data or provide it for hosting. Um, data, um, data custodians are split into data hosts and data providers. So the hosts make the data available for analysis. The providers um, are the ones who own the data and then uh, provide it to a host. They can also be one and the same. I think that's quite common, but we realized that sometimes an institution could provide data, but then didn't want to have um, additional work for management. Um, this is this was generally too with uh, the different um, sources we we communicated with, where they would happily share data, but then you know <laughs> didn't have the resources to keep tracking the data or working with the data. So they could be a provider, but not a host. Um, so we split these into in the into the two different roles. Um, then there's data modelers, uh, which is essentially the big science workshop participants. They were defining what the data is for and what kind of data is needed. Um, the data helpers are legal scholars, rights advocates, ethicists, people who help define and work through the protocols, processes, structures in order to abide, in order to abide by the data governance values, as well as the applicable, applicable law and human and cultural rights. Um, and then the data stewardship organization is the umbrella organization where representatives, representatives from all these different roles come together, communicate, collaborate, establish processes. Um, it's in place to discuss the shared goals, work on interoperability, um, figure out what should be prioritized um, and what kind of things might be shared across different parties. Um, and it serves a role of helping to instantiate the value pluralism approach. So if you have all these different institutions with different values, you have values for big science, you have values for data governance, you need to have a space where these all can be kind of hashed out in a collaborative manner. Um, so this was the role of the data stewardship organization. And it was essentially the working group that evolved into the stewardship organization. So um, when we started, the data working group was a set of a small set of people working on just the basics of the structure. As the year went on, different hosts and modelers and helpers all ended up joining um, to really work on operationalizing. Um, so this essentially became the data stewardship organization and the DSO, as it's called, is um, 
still ongoing. Um, we haven't met in a while, but there's still interest across the different parties on, on keeping this work going. Um, so if anyone is interested here, you're welcome to join the DSO. Um, I will uh, share an email at the end of the talk uh, that you can email to, to join if you'd like. Um, so what does the organization look like? Um, this slide is a bit of a summary slide, sort of like a TLDR. Uh, if you don't pay attention to anything else, pay attention to this. <laughs> so this is the overall map of the role and their relationship to one another. Um, and this uh, takes into account the different kinds of uh, values and priorities we had in play. So for example, ethicists um, and lawyers could help work through what was the most value-driven approach, what was the legal approach, and how these would interact in terms of meeting the needs of a data provider. So um, the primary hub of the governance structure is this data um, stewardship organization, or the DSO, as we began to call it. Um, it's the meeting place of all parties involved in governing the data. Um, the data rights holders um, are people and institutions who own the data. So this can be the people who rightfully should own the data that's scraped on things like common crawl. So people like you and me writing text on the internet. Um, as well as commercial companies like Spotify, um, libraries like the British Library, um, national libraries throughout the world seemed to be particularly relevant uh, data providers um, as their amazing storehouses of um, text-based data, um, as well as audio that can be transcribed, um, you know, spanning, spanning back in history. Um, so we found that national libraries were particularly um, interesting and useful from the perspective of operationalizing a values-informed data governance structure. Um, data custodians are those that uh, make the data accessible. Um, so data providers select the data that can be shared, and then the data hosts serve and manage that data. Um, data helpers is what we ended up calling the group of people who helped work through all of the nitty gritties. Um, so these are lawyers, rights advocates, ethicists, students, um, really working through how do we instantiate our values within the context of the relevant laws of different um, locations. So if you want to have um, data that's sourced all over the world, you have to pay attention to law all over the world and then cross that with the values and goals of the actual project. So having people who could kind of specialize in the dis different aspects of this within our collaborative space of discussion was really helpful. Um, it was also the data helpers who created formal agreements. Um, and we're, we actually are using one formal agreement um, for uh, sharing models um, as part of Hugging Face. So it's now emerged as um, a kind of license you can use called the rail license. I won't talk about it in this um, talk, but it's something to be aware of. That part of the big science effort um, ended up creating a new kind of license, which isn't exactly open source, but focuses on responsible, uh, responsible sourcing so that people have contestation, people have consent, that it sort of opens up uh, that, that ability. Uh, that, that ability. Um, so check out the RAIL license if you're interested. Um, we also have in the paper that was presented at FACT um, an appendix that actually includes um, some of the formal agreements that we worked on as well. Um, data modelers were the big science project people uh, writ large. Um, so defining the data that was needed, um, uh, specifying data sources, um, figuring out what would be interesting in terms of the data governance structure as well. Uh, and this <laughs> governance structure ultimately serves data consumers. Um, so this is people outside of the governance structure who seek to use the data, query the data, better understand it, uh, these kinds of things. 
So they're not exactly part of the governance structure, uh, but they benefit from the governance structure. And similarly, uh, the rights holders of the data benefit from having the structure in place um, when a consumer wants to use the data. Okay, so this fits into a much larger picture. Um, uh, I'm representing here the work on data governance from the data governance working group. Um, there's also a data sourcing group and a data tooling group, um, which we worked closely with. Um, and some of us were involved in multiple of these groups. So while the governance group focused on things like agreements and connecting um, and aligning values, uh, data tooling worked on things like filtering, uh, privacy, so PII, um, uh, details about um, hosting infrastructure, uh, data sourcing, uh, yet another working group, worked on identifying the relevant data, documenting it, cataloging it, describing the data details. So all of these sorts of things provided by data sourcing um, could be accessed by data consumers um, utilizing data tooling within the data governance structure. So all these things kind of interact together. Um, I'm trying to summarize it. Um, I hope it's clear that it's complicated, but doable if you can kind of separate out the roles and, uh, and values uh, in, a, in a sensible way. Um, so now I'll take a deep dive into data custodians, which is one of the fundamental parts of the data governance structure. Um, so data custodians make the data accessible to stakeholders, as I mentioned, and they can be either data providers, data hosts, or both. Data providers are individuals or institutions who have text, image, audio data that they can make available legally. Um, and this includes um, public domain. So you can make something available even if it's public domain because um, as public domain, it's legal to share, for you to share, for anyone else to share. Um, but if you happen to have the ownership of it, so as a library, you have this public domain information that other people don't, um, then you can legally share it, um, not because you're the uh, legal owner, uh, but because you have access to it and it's legal to share. Um, data providers can share either public open domain data or data that they have the specific rights to. Uh, so data providers are things like internet archival institutions, private companies, nonprofit organizations, or national libraries. Um, to be a data provider, you simply need to have text data, you have a legal basis for sharing that can be accessed in a controlled setting by researchers who agree to licensing terms, with that latter part being something that the governance structure was creating and enabling. Uh, data hosts make the data available for analysis. In practice, data hosts ended up being via Hugging Face. So Hugging Face has a hub where you can share different data sets. Um, and a lot of the tools that were implemented ended up being implemented as spaces on Hugging Face. Um, so Hugging Face ended up playing a data host role for a lot of different data providers. Um, a data host can simply be an organization with a server where the data can live. Um, and then depending on the data sources and the data provider, the, um, the data might be subject to additional access control. So such as exclusivity uh, to individuals who just wanna use the data for research, for example. Um, and there are two main steps. One is liaising with the data providers. So there's this close relationship between the data provider and data host, and what the host does needs to be okay by the provider. Um, and then management and serving, which is actually making that data available. If there's access controls, um, like gating, um, actually reviewing the proposals to use the data, making sure that this is a party you would want to share the data with. Um, all these kinds of nitty gritty details of, um, of, of making the data actually viewable or usable in some way. Um, we broke this up into process and infrastructure. 
Um, so, uh, so data hosts do the do, do the liaison liaising. I'm I'm not a good French speaker. My my co chair is a French speaker, so I usually make him uh, do this liaison. Um, <laughs> but basically, you know, receiving the requests um, and then hosting the data. Um, and then data management and serving is actually uh, checking the user permissions, approving and rejecting requests, handling data co contestation if um, contestation requests come through, tracking the data access, um, all of these kinds of things that have to do with um, how the data is actually interacting with the rest of the world. Um, Within the context of the governance structure, there were two main kinds of agreements that needed to be developed. One was the agreement between data hosts and data providers. Um, so if it's the same institution, then you know there doesn't need to be a separate formal agreement. But in the case where they were two different institutions, there needed to be alignment on the data dissemination, the conditions for serving the data, and then the various rights that need uh, to be respected with respect to derived work. So, for example, um, if a data consumer does something with the data, creates an augmented data set, and shares it with the data host, it was the role of the host to share that back to the provider. So the provider could maintain, um, uh, I guess, I don't want to say control, but they could maintain contact with the data as it evolved from their original source. Um, and we see here on the right, it's an excerpt from the data host and provider agreement. Um, this is also uh, in the appendix of the paper in full. If anyone wants to use it, um, I'm happy to share links um, as well. Some organizations have their own. Um, so we used um, prior work in helping to establish this, um, but, but did all this work within the context of machine learning and all the details of what data means for machine learning. Another agreement is needed between the consumers and the hosts. And this was quite light touch. So basically I come in as a researcher, I wanna take a look at this data, how, what do I do? And so the agreement between consumers and hosts could be something as easy as read this license and click if you agree. And we ended up putting that in place um, for a few things um, on the Hugging Face Hub. So uh, this, this also provided things like uh, specific use case restrictions, uh, but essentially it was the mechanism that helped open the gate uh, between the consumer and, and the data. Um, the data custodians had a few sort of checklists uh, to, to adhere to. So for data providers, the, the creation of the data had to be compatible with data governance values. So it couldn't be exploitative, for example, or collected without consent. Um, uh, the data providers have to be able to license the data sets for research, including open domain, that's fine, um, and work with the corresponding data host. Um, the data host has to be a registered legal entity in the region of interest. Um, facilitate data aspect. Uh, sorry, uh, did I just cut off? I saw myself as frozen. I'm going to start the data host bit again. Again. So the data host um, has to be a registered legal entity, and that's because the in order to have sort of legal rights to the data, you need to have um, some sort of legal standing. Um, and then that also allows the data host to be plugged into the local laws of the relevant data. Um, data hosts needed to facilitate data access, respect the ethical charter and the governance values, um, as well as the licensing agreements. And then ideally also willing to carry out data management. So further tracking of the data and further processing of the data um, sort of additional details that help with data provenance and usage documentation. So some examples of data use uh, that came out of this project um, were, 
a ton of different things, everything from just looking at the statistics of words to analysis of biases and stereotypes. This is still ongoing. People here, organizations here, you're free to be part of this as well. Um, we have a variety of tools uh, developed as part of this to help with visualization and exploration. Um, the entire uh, the entire corpus that was used for training has now been indexed. So it's queryable. Um, you're able to figure out collocations, um, you know, any sort of interesting thing that you might be curious about um, having to do with the words and the text and that sort of thing um, uh, is available via various tools now. Um, so it helps with doing things like understanding the naturalness of the language, the relationship between inputs and outputs, all of these fundamental research questions about training data for a language model, and then language model behavior can be tackled uh, once you have a way to directly work with that data. Um, so we've seen a lot of uh, different kinds of projects working with data in a variety of different ways. Um, so some lessons learned and next steps. Um, again, this is ongoing. Uh, we would really like to continue persisting a governance structure for another year. If anyone is interested, please reach out. Um, it's been it's been difficult to put together as large of a governance structure as we would have liked. Uh, so really looking to expand to be as international as possible. Um, some hard questions we've begun to solve is how to address contestation, um, including with trained models. Um, so we have licenses. Um, we've um, within Hugging Face, which was a you know a large supporter of the big science effort, have now uh, put together some contestation forms um, so people can fill out information if they want their data removed. Um, uh, another hard question was around proving legal compliance, and uh, to that end, we developed these uh, formal agreements um, and sort of licenses that had to be obeyed. Um, another hard question was uh, how to prevent dissemination of the data beyond approved use cases, um, and this um, was somewhat somewhat addressed by putting in place access controls. Um, and this is something that at, at Hugging Face, we've done specifically with models um, more and more across the board, we're doing uh, access controls for models. Um, data has been something that has not had as much requests uh, for, for access control, um, but still the same sort of fundamental idea of um, gating the access. Um, and making sure that anyone who uses it agrees to the use cases. Um, another hard question was how do we keep trusted data secure? Um, this is something that we didn't make a ton of progress on, although we have you know, ideas that we developed as part of this. Um, there's a variety of tools that were developed as part of this, um, data exploration tools, um, the ability to navigate documentation and metadata and all this other kind of stuff um, that's now available through big science. Um, what was hard was this uh, essentially starting from nothing and trying to build an international governance structure. <laughs> Turns out that it's tricky. Um, and at first there was a lot of confusion about what we were doing. Um, and we didn't know fully, right? You know, we had a basic idea, but we really needed to work through everything and iterate in order to start getting to specifics about what we were doing and how things would work. Um, so that was, that was quite hard. Um, data hosts joining was also um, quite difficult. So although institutions might be interested in providing data, they tended to be less interested in hosting the data. So um, in a lot of situations, Hugging Face just ended up being the host because we were the ones interested in it. Um, and then inclusion beyond the US and Europe was quite difficult. Um, we spent a lot of time talking to people from different countries, um, but really, really struggled to get buy-in to the project. 
Um, what, when did, what went really well was um, that the structure we developed ended up being quite flexible, um, possible to work in lots of different priorities and ideas. Um, the value pluralism approach I mentioned, where big, um, big science had values, and then the governance group had values, that, that ended up working really well. Um, we had uh, good luck with um, data providers and hosts who had their own data and were uh, open and really excited to do this kind of work or were already doing this kind of work. Um, and we also luckily had a lot of public goodwill. So you could see this going another way where, um, you know, there would be negative um, pushback against us, for example, um, doing anything that would expand the kind of data that language models could use. Um, but I think across the board, people seem to understand that we were trying to work within machine learning paradigms to create um, as just structures as, as we can. Um, cool. So continued work is the persistence of the, the governance structure. Please join if you're interested. Um, and um, yeah, I think that uh, from there, that's about it. Uh, so I will, uh, let's see, not much to say here other than that uh, there's lots of things to do. Um, the academic paper is called Data Governance in the Age of Large-Scale Data-Driven Language Technology. That has tons of further details. Um, and thank you so much for listening. <laughs>